It's time for Security Now with Steve Gibson. I'm here in place of Leo Laporte, so I'll do my best to keep up. We're going to be talking all about some uh, updates on the Apache Struts vulnerability from last week. Uh, there's a new vulnerability in all Android devices that aren't running Pi, which is basically all Android devices. Uh, a very unexpected outcome uh, of the GDPR legislation in the EU. We're going to talk about something called Sonar Snoop. And it's really kind of strange and interesting. You won't want to miss it. Security Now is next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Security Now with Steve Gibson, episode 679, recorded on Tuesday, September 4th, 2018. Sonar Snoop. This episode of Security Now is brought to you by FreshBooks, the ridiculously easy to use cloud accounting software helping small business owners thrive. Try it free for 30 days at freshbooks.com slash security now. And by Thinkst Canary. Detect attackers or malicious insiders on your network with honeypots that can be deployed in minutes. For 10% off and a 60-day money-back guarantee, go to canary.tools slash twit and enter the code twit in the how did you hear about us box. And by Ring. Ring's alarm security kit is a smarter way to protect your entire home. Go to ring.com slash security now to learn how you can get whole home security for only $10 per month. It's time for Security Now, the show where we talk about all the latest security news, everything that's happening in the security front. Uh, Leo is out for the next couple of weeks, actually, this week and the Three. next two weeks, right? So yep. three solid weeks, you're going to have to listen to me going, what did Steve just say? Uh, that's basically what my role is on security now. Steve Gibson, you are the man with all the knowledge. How are you doing, Steve? Hey, Jason, great <laughs> to be with you for the first of three. And, you know, uh, you did this, what, about a month and a half ago, I guess. Yeah. Uh, and it went well. And yeah. we, sort of, we have our... We sort of have our routine down. I think it's going to be great. I think it's going to be good. I will almost in, undoubtedly play the role of of person asking you to, maybe not asking you to repeat yourself, but having a very large question mark above my head at the beginning <laughs> of the story, and maybe a check mark at the end of the story. I'd be like, ah. well, I guess since this since yesterday was Labor Day, um, this marks the official beginning of. Well, I guess it winter or at least it's end of summer. It feels uh, yeah, it feels we, like fallish. As we plow into uh, uh September, right? Yeah. So yep. uh, off we go. Um so the the most interesting piece of of well, the most in, 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 interesting thing that happened in the last week, I think. So, sometimes as the last time you and I were together, it was just there wasn't anything that really stood out. It was just like lots of news. This time there was, I mean, I, I w it was easy to pick one because some researchers also showed a paper at, now it's been about three weeks ago, uh, the Usenix Security Symposium in Baltimore, where they, they surprised everybody by figuring out how to use the co-located microphones and speakers <laughs> on, in this case, it was a Samsung S4 smartphone to essentially disambiguate the unlock strokes that the phone user was using in what they called sonar snoop. So it, it, it actually turns the, the microphone and speakers or microphones and speakers, because there's two of each, into working sonar in order to allow them to track the person's finger movements on the screen. So uh, really interesting piece of research there. And it to me, it feels like, because I, I read the PDF and uh, I think it was 18 pages of rather detailed research, I think this is something that, if anyone is interested, can be much further refined. But anyway, we'll get to that. Um, we did have a bunch of stuff, uh, as exp as expected, uh, and as happened previously with a Apache Struts vulnerability, 
We have now seen lots of action on it in the past week, which we'll talk about. We've got an interim patch for last week's announced zero-day privilege elevation surprise, uh, an information disclosure vulnerability present in all uh, – I said I wrote, I wrote here in, in my notes all Android, but actually it's all – before Android 9, a.k.a. Android P. Did that ever get a, an official name, by the way? <laughs> yeah, it's Pi. It's Android okay, Pi. Pi. And I mean, okay, really, good. those those two are distinctions <laughs> without much of a difference. How many people really have Pi right now? It's a pretty small percentage. So, Yeah, so because yeah. I, I had in my notes pre-P, and I thought, what? Yeah. No. So now it's uh, pre-Pi. Right. We also have Instagram, uh, after a bunch of high-profile uh, hacks, has finally, like, okay, reluctantly, it seems, moved to tighten things up. We'll talk about that. Another open SSH information disclosure problem, which is being handled differently than the last one uh, in an interesting fashion. We've got an unexpected outcome of the GDPR legislation that took effect three months ago in the EU. Not anything I would have predicted, but uh, we'll talk about that. Also, the return of something we discussed in 2014 called the misfortune cookie uh, that affects medical devices. Uh, also, many thousands, I mean many thousands, of magneto commerce sites are being exploited uh, with a, 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 a skimming script. We also have, believe it or not, a fundamental design flaw in the trusted platform module version two spec, which is what all of us now have in certainly in in corporate uh, servers and desktops, and you know many standard desktops have have TPM protection in them in order to secure the boot process. Turns out that can be circumvented. So we'll talk about that. Also, we often are all well. We're always referring to CVE numbers. It turns out that MITRE is the is the contractor of kind of of the US government that is running the system and they've been having problems lately which and maybe the government is going to come to their aid Mozilla has announced plans to improve tracking control and some other aspects of Firefox and we've got a gratuitous round of Win 10 patches from Microsoft, which actually my machine, my Win 10 machine, which I run Skype on, uh, managed to get through this morning. I always, I always <laughs> deliberately start it hours in advance in order to like let it get this out of its system beforehand. So that's done, and then we're going to wrap up with uh, a discussion of this uh, a new side channel attack bouncing sound waves off of the user's finger as they as they unlock their phone. So. Uh, I think uh, another great podcast for our listeners. Absolutely. It's jam pack, packed and full. I got to say real quick, you're a brave man to do your Windows updates before the show, even <laughs> even if it's hours in advance. Maybe that's True. different now, I, you know, uh, but <laughs> I almost always feel like I have to push those off until after the show because you just never know. Well, if you get behind, it could be yeah. really bad. Oh, for you know, sure. Like I went to a conference a year ago where uh, someone had a laptop that I kind of got the sense they like they're normally they're normally desk bound. And so they're using their normal probably desk system. But they like grabbed their laptop and off they went to the conference. They plugged it in and turned it on. And it was like half a day. <laughs> I mean, they were like sitting there not able to do anything for like while it caught up with everything that had gone on while it hadn't been uh, alive. So you know, if you keep it, you know, if, if, if you bring windows up every, every week or two, you're probably not going to fall too far behind. Yeah. Right. And don't get caught using conference Wi-Fi to, to make all those updates. Uh, that's going to nah, take even that's, longer. That that's too, like nightmare that on too. top of nightmare. That too. <laughs> well, we've got a lot of that stuff to talk about. Obviously a bunch of security news uh, to kick off with before we do though, Let's take a moment and thank the sponsor of this episode of Security Now, and that's FreshBooks, most accounting software. Uh, as you might know, it's built for accountants, maybe not so much for business owners. FreshBooks is a owner-first accounting platform. It puts you, the small business owner, back in control of your business. FreshBooks approachable accounting 
It's full industry standard double entry accounting that enables painless automatic bookkeeping and reporting. The more you can make this automatic and automated throughout, the easier it's going to be and the, the better it's going to be used, right? People are going to use it properly. You can quickly uh, generate and access accounting reports like the general ledger, trial balance, chart of accounts in the FreshBooks uh, dashboard, and then you can share those reports with your accountant or financial advisor as they need them. Uh, you can send professional looking invoices and it doesn't take long. It takes just seconds. You can see sent, viewed, paid, overdue invoices, all super easily, accept online payments directly from your invoice, right? You're getting that, that payment uh, capability tied right in with the very first thing they see when you send in that invoice. You're going to get paid an average of two times faster. Create proposals with rich text content and images. You can request your client's e-signature as they accept those proposals. So it's right on there when it counts. You can send invoices, estimates, and proposals in multiple language. So everybody's covered. It's in multiple languages. Uh, FreshBooks automatically connects to your bank account and updates expenses daily. It does this all on the fly for you. You can also import your expenses in bulk or even take a picture of that receipt that you just got. You can upload it and let FreshBooks do all of the rest for you. Keep tabs on your business no matter where you are with the FreshBooks mobile app. Doing it as you go makes things infinitely easier when you sit down to do mission critical things later. If you're still conquering the day-to-day -day tasks of creating invoices and collecting payments, FreshBooks is the magic wand that you're looking for. And if you have great ambitions, maybe you need robust accounting, FreshBooks can grow with you. No matter what your accounting needs are, FreshBooks is going to help put you in the driver's seat, and that's going to make everything easier, more manageable, and more accurate. Join the 24 million people who have used FreshBooks to painlessly send invoices, uh, track time, and capture expenses, and get back to doing what you love. Try FreshBooks free for 30 days at freshbooks.com slash security now. You'll want to enter security now in the how did you hear about us section. Make sure and do that so that they know that you came from this show. That's freshbooks.com slash security now. And we thank FreshBooks for their support. All right. So we got a stack of security news here. And may, and apparently you made a prediction. Did you make this prediction last week? As far as Apache no. Struts is concerned? or well, you just we, we, we do need to, to first look at our picture of the week. Which okay, let's do picture is, of the week. It's first. one of those Sorry. where, like, you really can't make this up. I just got a kick out of this. Someone sent this to me, and I've I've had it in my list of pictures that we would get to when when we like had an opening when when there wasn't something else happening. Mm -hmm. So this is a screenshot that appears authentic. I have no reason to doubt it, which is the Windows error reporting dialog, which has been presented to someone. <laughs> announcing that Windows error reporting has stopped working. Oh, boy. So, <laughs> <laughs> how, so how was it able to do that if uh, it stopped working? Pretty, it, I, I guess it maybe squeezed this in just before it died. <laughs> it was its Wait, last no, breath. No, no, like, that wouldn't work because it would be it would say that it was stopped working and thus, then it was going to try to show you the dialogue. So I don't know. This is very fancy coding on Microsoft's part. Yeah. Apparently, it's unable to anticipate the fact that it is about to die. And so <laughs> let's show them a dialogue saying goodbye and good night, you know, as our last act. I don't, oh, I don't know. Yeah. Anyway. Seems, uh, seems I just a little this fishy is just to so me. Good. It's, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or maybe maybe once it crashed, because you can't anticipate a crash necessarily, but you can look backwards once it relaunches and say a crash happened. So maybe it pops it up when it relaunches somehow. Or I I don't know how it's able to do that. That's that's very strange. Yeah. Well, and, and it says in the fine print a problem caused the program. Oh. Uh, in this case, Windows error reporting <laughs> to stop working correctly. So I guess that means to start working oh. incorrectly. Uh, Windows will close the program and notify you if a solution is available. Oh, so oh. in that case, okay. it hasn't actually closed it yet. So that's how it was able to put it up. Because if that was the program, then it's saying, ah. here's, the, here's the error message. We're going to close it now. And so when okay. you... Okay, or I guess maybe technically 
it could be reworded. Windows error reporting is about to stop working. Right, exactly. And so it's like, oh, here we go. You know, this last chance. And there's no button for, no, don't stop working. Uh, there is always the power button. Uh, <laughs> That's true. So, okay. So, okay. Prediction. Um, it, uh, yes, I did predict it be only because of what we recently saw. So Apache Struts is a very popular Java server-side application framework, which is notably used by, uh, I think it's 70-some, I don't remember the number now, but like a lot of the Fortune 100 major corporations in the US, uh, it's just very popular. And it's had problems. Uh, it is the reason that Equifax had that breach that ended up costing them $600 million last year. What happened was there had been like six months before a, a notice of a serious problem with the Apache Struts framework, which allowed unauthenticated remote access. Equifax, one of those big corporations that uses Apache struts, uh, they just never got around to updating their Apache struts, which allowed bad guys in and their entire database got exfiltrated. So the industry hopefully took this as a wake up call. We did have uh, about three months ago, I'm guessing a, a different problem found and, and the, the, the oh I, I remember the way it was it was it was on a Wednesday of whatever week it was the announcement was from the Apache Struts guys a super critical uh, vulnerability is going to be fixed patched a week from now at like some you know like exactly a certain time of the morning so everybody I mean this is bad so if you are affected by this. Get ready. Uh, you're going to want to update your system immediately because the developers wrote, we don't think it's going to take anybody long to reverse engineer what we've fixed and then start scanning the Internet for vulnerable systems. Um, it took hours before the vulnerability was understood. Scanning began. And I think it was like three days before we began to see malicious attacks based on it. So based on that, when when um, when we last week covered the fact that there was, whoops, another problem that eh, not quite so bad because the default, the, the vanilla installation of Apache struts was not vulnerable. Now we know more about it. And there's a there's a package known as Struts, struts Convention which is a plugin that by default flips some switches to true, which enables this vulnerability. So, so the, the guy who found it last week explained that all struts were vulnerable unless patched. And that's from versions 2.3 to 2.3.34 and on the 2.5 channel from 2.5 to 2.5.16, which are like the ones that are actively in use and supported now. They're all vulnerable. So, so uh, the, the discoverer of this explained that e even if you weren't now vulnerable, a configuration change downstream could make you vulnerable. Now we know, we have all the details about that. The guys uh, from Palo Alto uh, Networks, <clears throat> I think that was uh, Palo Alto Networks. Uh, I'm looking for it, I had it in my notes. Anyway, uh, yeah, Unit 42 at Palo Alto Networks, mm -hmm. uh, they explained in detail what was necessary and, and also connected this to this Struts Convention plugin which would which would by default make any site using it vulnerable. So the the guy who found it last week said even if you're not vulnerable today, really update. 
And, and as we said last week, uh, boy, you know, given what happened to Equifax, unless you've got an extra 600 billion, I mean, million lying around, you, pro you probably, you know, uh, wouldn't have that much exposure, but still worth updating yourself. So, and so the prediction part is that sure enough, within, well, actually what, what, what Palo Alto Networks said in their note was they said, um, some have noted that a previous critical struts vulnerability was actively attacked last year, only three days after the release of the security update and vulnerability information. They, and they, they continued saying, there are no known active attacks at this time. And by the way, this was being written two days after the vulnerability disclosure. And the current requirement that two non-default conditions need to be met for the vulnerability to be exploitable makes for a different threat environment. In other words, less concern to some degree. However, the vulnerability was disclosed on August 22nd. They wrote that on the 24th. Active scanning for vulnerable systems was observed on the 25th. Uh, two cybersecurity firms, Gray Noise Intelligence and Vo Volexity, have detected threat actors scanning for struts servers last week, but they did not identify any attempts of exploitation. And as we know, and again, this is this pattern is repeating. So scanning precedes attacks. Attacks are expected. And there has been some now, since then, the... Uh, some observation of coin mining being installed on vulnerable servers. However, the the most fun about this whole thing, and I'm hope I'm hoping you're going to be able to put this on the screen, is that for all time, the bar has been raised on vulnerability disclosure and demo sites. Uh, our li our li our listeners will certainly remember the heart bleed problem from last year. It had a great logo. This notion of, oh, vulnerabilities need good names and they need good logos. And of course, we have uh, Spectre, the little ghost holding the stick and, and so forth. Anyway, uh, I have a link in the show notes <laughs> to the the Apache Struts uh, CVE, and this is CVE 2018-11776. Uh, Oh and yeah. Yes, you you're now showing it in the in the video stream and it's like, <laughs> okay, this has for all time, you know, up to the ante on let's see what you know on on a page which discloses the vulnerability and details it. Uh this actually has a complete tutorial on the exploitation of the vulnerability. So anyway, uh um it's becoming a little bit of a of of a of a PR competition now when people come up with, with new vulnerabilities. I think the next That's step cool. is that they're going to embed a full 22 minute cartoon that explains <laughs> that's, that's how the obvious next step. Wow. <laughs> so also last week we had a, a person who I just used the pronoun. He not knowing any better uh, sandbox escaper was the person's Twitter handle. Uh, and I just said he without knowing. I later picked up some uh, feedback saying that this was actually a woman. I don't know, a, a female. I don't know how I would be expected to know that, but somebody did. So for what it's worth, she uh, tweeted that uh, so it was sad to the fact that she really didn't care what happened to her in life any longer. Uh, she had found a, a vulnerability in Windows, Windows 10, 64-bit, which allowed a, an attacker with no privilege to escalate or elevate to full system privilege. Uh, and she didn't feel like reporting it for whatever reason to Microsoft. So she just told the whole world about it, uh, posted the proof of concept on GitHub and said, here you go. So now this is not super critical. It's not a remote code execution, zero day, 
where suddenly every Windows 10 system on the internet would be vulnerable, but still a, a privilege elevation. I mean, the reason we have privilege controls on all modern operating systems is we have that we create this notion of a root user who can do anything and a typical user who administratively and deliberately limits what they can do so that if a program they're running on their account happens to try to get up to some mischief it won't be able to go rewrite the os files and so forth so so the point is that while by itself it isn't super crucial, it is absolutely something that any malware would want in its toolkit because until fixed, it allows such a program to do whatever it wants. So such that e even the guest account, even a program running as guest is able to do anything it wants to on the system. So, um, um, the now we know much more detail about it. It's been vetted by a number of other researchers. We discussed one last week that had already confirmed that that this thing was legitimate. Since then, a small tweak has been found that op that widens its scope to 32-bit systems as well. And due to a a hard-coded file name. It was Win 10 only. Changing a, a digit 3 to a digit 1 allows it to also attack Windows 7. So its scope has broadened. The good news is it's such a simple oversight in, the, in one API. This actually is in the task scheduler. The Windows task ske scheduler API has a function uh, schedule RPC, which is remote procedure call, set security that that function fails to check permissions so anybody even a guest who has deliberately restricted access rights can call it and use it to set file permissions on any local file the way that the exploit works is it allows <coughs> excuse me a hard link to be created and then calls a print job using the XPS printer, which ever since Windows XP Service Pack 2 has been present by default in Windows systems, uh, that allows the spooler process to invoke a, a hijack DLL, which has been given full system privileges, and then you're off to the races, and this thing can do anything it wants to on your system. So it's expected that Microsoft will fix this easily, um, I, there is a company, uh, Acros Security, which has been previously publishing a series of what they call micro patches, which are basically little code tweaks to existing programs, which may not be updated by their publishers because the publishers don't care. The software has gone out of support or, or whatever. They have produced one of these micro patches for this problem. On the other hand, we're now uh, at September 4th, the first Tuesday of the month, uh, patch Tuesday being next week. So within a week, this is almost certainly going to get fixed by Microsoft. Um, and, and again, it doesn't expose you to badness from the outside. It's not a network exploitable. It's a purely a local API call requiring code running on your system. Again, it's, it's not nothing. I mean, it's code running on your system, which is malicious, would love to have this. So it's, it's not good that this, this uh, sandbox escaper person chose not to responsibly disclose this to Microsoft but that's the way it is. So where there is a micro patch, I've got, it's just zeropatch.com if anyone is concerned and interested. Um, I don't like the idea of, th of applying third party things to Windows. Um, it, it turns out it's a very, it was a very simple thing to fix. They had just, they moved a couple 
uh, function calls around, three instructions needed to be changed in order to fix this. So as as patches go, it's probably about as benign as possible, but you know, you're better off keeping bad stuff out of your system to start with. So anyway, that's that sort of wraps up. We'll wrap it up for sure next week when we verify that this has been fixed in next Tuesday's Patch Tuesday. Uh, but again, uh, that sort of uh, provides some more details to what we were talking about last week. <clears throat> and I mean, um, how, how often does does that happen where someone finds finds a, a vulnerability like this and doesn't go through the responsible kind of disclosure of it and just is like drops it like a bomb onto the internet in it's, this way. It's true. It, it, it we're seeing this sort of responsible disclosure now is the has become the the regular routine. Microsoft mm -hmm. acknowledges the the people who found it. Uh, you know, all of the security papers that we talk about are being released only after the problems they describe have been fixed. So it's it's certainly more dramatic if you disclose uh, some horror that still exists, but you then, I mean, you really then become an outcast within the security community. No responsible researcher will do that because, you know, you're just opening the floodgates for instantaneous exploitation. I mean, right. I mean, even a, a perfect example is, is Apache struts problem e here it was responsibly disclosed. No one knew about it until the patch was made available. What we now know is that even things that are patched often, I mean, e even things for which patches are available still end up with systems for a long time um, remaining unpatched. So, I mean, you know, this is really the only way to go. It's, it's only fringe, uh, fringe researchers who, you know, just don't really care about their own reputation uh, who do this. And that's sort of what she said in, in her tweet was, mm -hmm. I don't care about life anymore. It's like, oh, mm -hmm. okay. Sorry about that. But, yeah. you know, anyway. Um, and speaking of things <clears throat> that will never be patched. Um, uh, You're talking about Android, aren't you? I am. I'm sorry, Jason. <laughs> I know it's, it's your okay. beloved, it's it's okay. your beloved it's, platform. Uh, you know uh, what? For years, I've been involved with Android. I've just gotten used to it at this point. It's just the way it is. Another vulnerability that leads just to something. Just wear bad. your armor. Just, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, all versions of Android running on all devices are believed to be affected because this was a, what we're going to describe here is a core Android function, which Google has fixed in the most recent Android Pi release, but has said they have no plans to fix in older versions. And they're being, they're saying you're encouraged to upgrade to Android Pi or later. Well, I don't have to tell you, Jason, you know, the likelihood of that happening. Yeah. I mean, many, like in many places you can't, I mean, it's just not an option. You're, you're stuck with the Android that you have. Um, and the Android that you have, if it predates Pi, is subject to a CVE. This is the, you know, common vulnerabilities and exploits database. 2018-9489, uh, which has been assigned to this problem. And all Android devices prior to Pi, until they're updated, or maybe there'll be a patch, we'll see. So what's going on? The OS broadcasts, on purpose, system messages, which are global, and which any application can indicate uh, they're, they're, they're called intents and any application can uh, can raise its hand and say uh, I'd like to receive those please um, and it then receives them without any user permission oversight so the you know these are not things like use the permission to use the camera or you know other, major aspects of the system, these are sort of regarded as internal stuff that's going on. Unfortunately, the 
The messages include the Wi-Fi network name to which the device is currently associated, the BSS ID, the local IP address, the DNS server information, and the device's own static MAC address. Um, some of this information, such as MAC addresses, has long since been recognized as sensitive and it has no longer may, been made available uh, through standard Android APIs uh, since Android 6. But now we're at 9, and even in, even in before 6, 6, 7, and 8, that MAC address is available via the broadcast. So this argues that the them that, that Google masking the MAC address wasn't you know fully done. The the API to request it was it was removed from, but you can still raise your hand and say, uh, you know, broadcast it to me, and then you receive it. So by listening to these broadcasts, which are continuous, any application on the device can capture this information, um, which in turn has the effect of bypassing all permission checks and existing mitigations. So, it, you know, this leakage does undermine Android's system of permissions. Um, of course, we know that MAC addresses do not change and are tied to the hardware. So this can be used to uniquely identify and track any Android device when, even when MAC address randomization is used. Because as we've discussed here, MAC address randomization is the pre-access point association MAC. It was realized some time ago, and Android and iOS both fixed this, uh, and I guess Windows did too, that, that wandering around and not just like anywhere, you know, you know we, we, Wi-Fi is so present that it's just, you know, you're bathed in Wi-Fi now. So it turns out that any access point could see the MAC addresses of all, do, does see the MAC addresses of every Wi-Fi enabled thing within its reach, even those that don't associate with it, that never have and don't. Um, so, so what we realized was, okay, that's not so good. So... MAC address randomization causes the client to just generate an arbitrary random MAC address for what, during the time that it is not associated. But when it associates, only then do you get the true MAC address. So that's sort of a nice privacy trade-off that works and which everybody is doing. The problem is that the any app running in Android prior to 9.0, is able to uh, to determine the physical unrandomized MAC address, the network name, uh, and the BSS ID. And of course, there are databases. Uh, there's w uh, Wiggle, W I G L E, and Skyhook, both which are comprehensive databases of exactly that information, which would allow software to geo geolocate the user using that information even when that software has no has not been gr granted any location permission when location is completely shut off uh, on the device presumably because the user wants privacy this is still disclosing it so uh, uh, unless some sort of mitigation is made available uh, this is the way it's going to be on all Android prior to nine. Um, there's a, a cool website. Um, uh, I thought I had it here, the website. Um, Are you talking about the app? or? Yeah, the Android Broadcast yeah, Monitor. Broadcast logger, or let's see here. In uh, internal yeah. Broadcast Monitor. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, it, it was. Yes, Internal Broadcasts Monitor is the application developed uh, by a developer who also put the source on GitHub. Er, internal Broadcasts Monitor is available through Google Play. And 
Uh, so you can install it from the Play Store. You tap Start, and you start observing all of the traffic which is available to it not having obtained any permissions whatsoever. You look for android.net.wifi.statechange and android.net.wifi.p2p.thisdevicechanged messages and the data they carry, and you will see all this. So, uh, you know, not a huge problem, but if, an, if a user is interested in not being located, yet the only way to do that before nine and until this is maybe fixed by a third party patch or maybe Google will reconsider their position. But on the other hand, there's all these phones that are not Google and that are not being patched um, would be to turn off Wi-Fi because uh, it basically is by, you know, the, the, the software is still going to know your Mac address. Well, OK, you know, you stalled it on your phone. So that's where it is. But uh, these days, Wi-Fi is is essentially leaking your position by virtue of the fact that we have databases of, of just comprehensive databases of, of network names and BSS IDs. And software is able through these messages to know uh, what you're connected to and what device you are. And so produce long term tracking. And of course, you know, it's able to send the information out wherever it wants to. So. Uh, we may be talking more about this in the future. <laughs> it's it's kind of disappointing when they stop at like the current version with nothing prior. I mean, this Pi is on so few devices that it doesn't even make Android's developer platform for show or the dashboard for showing how many you know percentages all of the reporting devices at <laughs> what OS. Like Pi's not even on there yet, which basically means it's wow. less than 0.1% distribution at this point in time, at least at the you know the time that this report was pulled. So it's not even appearing on their report that tracks this stuff, let alone those are the only devices that actually get any of this protection. So it's not inaccurate to say kind of at this point, virtually all yeah. a Android devices are, are currently enabling this broadcast ing yep. and any and any apps which will i imagine will start appearing uh <laughs> are able to well because i mean it's it's meant to be system global broadcasts so mm -hmm. the fact that an app is is saying i i want to watch these doesn't you know i mean it, it's not going to make the app stand out it's not something where google can say oh you shouldn't be asking for this no it's it's a broadcast mm -hmm. yeah and Google obviously knows this is not a good thing. They patched it. Uh, That's you know, why they, so. yep, why they fixed it. That's a bummer. So, um, okay, Instagram was victim to some high-profile attacks. Um, so they've, uh, and, and this, is, I think, is really interesting because uh, they have formally switched from SMS-based text messages to confirm your identity as an as a as an additional factor yeah. to yes third party authenticator apps meaning that they've switched to the time based one time passwords so yay what's interesting is that um, these high profile attacks on Instagram users occurred even though they were protected by second factor SMS based multi-factor authentication, which s strongly suggests that the weakness of texting six-digit codes is not just theoretical, it's now actual, it's now proven. So um, anyway, it's good that they're doing that. They've also moved to combat what they've termed influence campaigns. They're showing, first of all, they are making available the same way Twitter does, verified accounts you need to prove your identity to them your real world physical identity by for example sending them a picture of a government issued id proving who you are uh, in order to become a verified instagram instagram account uh, and they're they've added the ability to view account information which shows the date the account was created, the country the account is 
is centered in all ads that the account is currently running, any former usernames that the account has gone under, as well as any other public accounts which share with it a large common set of followers. So bravo to Instagram. It's uh, a little disheartening that it's taken them this long to implement these measures, but uh, it, it really feels like, you know, yes, we are getting there and it's better than not getting there. Uh, and, I, and I think what we're doing is we're, as a consequence of really pretty much what's gone on in 2018, uh, and probably, I guess, in reaction ultimately to all the press that the involvement of of foreign parties or alleged involvement of foreign parties in the 2016 presidential election uh, uh, two years ago had, um, that we're now sort of setting a new standard for the way this can be done. And um, it really feels also as though SMS text messages, I mean, that you know, they were used – because they were the lowest common denominator. Everybody who wanted to get authenticated, who had a smartphone, was able to receive a text message. You didn't need to install an app to do that. And so, you know, everyone's non-technical relative was able to to say, oh, I just got a, a, a six-digit code. I need to put that in. It's like, okay, that's easily done. Unfortunately, uh, it wasn't secure enough. So, you know, we've moved as an industry, I think, past that now. Uh, and uh, I, I imagine it won't be long before authenticator apps won't be third party authenticator apps. They'll just be part of the underlying OS. It's, you know, it's like clearly it's time for that to happen. That would be really nice, actually. I, I hadn't considered that as a solution. But as you were kind of talking about that, like it, it it's apparent to me that SMS is infinitely easier for the broad spectrum of people to do because their phone already does SMS versus having I, an app installed. That's one extra hurdle. People might not understand why they need to install this app to do it when it already works on SMS. Build it into the OS. That's a really great solution. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And, and in fact, I saw a, something and I didn't I didn't take the time to track it down, but it looked like there was some provision for automatically registering the secret that drives the one time password token within like an inter app API. So if it were built in and if there was <clears throat> a secure means for doing that. It might be possible for you to say, I want two-factor authentication and for the site to, to right then auto-register your secret with the built-in authentication app. And so, you know, so you don't, you're not even having to, to, um, to uh, manually move that from one place to another, which again, I mean, then that really makes it much more, uh, you know, easy to use. Well, and you even see that right now on SMS, right? At least on, on uh, I've noticed it before where SMS was the only choice for authenticating. That message right. comes through and it automatically populates that into the app. The app that I'm using, trying to get into, recognizes that came from the, I guess it came from the number it expected to get it, plugs the number yep. in. You don't have to do anything. It's just like, great, we got it. Yep. Move on. Yeah. So. Yeah. Unfortunately, the bad guys got it too. Yeah, right. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, Google also has their other authentication where when I log into their account, I will get a just a pop-up on my on my phone that says, is that you logging in? Yes or no. So instead of doing a code or yep. whatever, where does that yep. where does that fall on the kind of the security spectrum as far as that's well, concerned? It's, Better it's than using SMS, I assume. It is, but it's proprietary, and so right. the the advantage of the of of the generic one time uh, password is that you 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 get to choose which app you want. You're able to to store them yourselves. Uh, there, there there there's a tool on iOS called OTP Auth, which I have started to use and like. Uh, I think I was using LastPasses for a while, um, and Leo and I talked about this. Uh, OTP Auth does use iOS Cloud in order to synchronize, which is uh, provides additional convenience. So that as long as you set it up that way, uh, if you add another account to it 
on one device, all your other iOS devices automatically know about it. So it's it ends up, you know, further Im improving the experience. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And Jason, yes. time for our second break. All right, let's take a break. Hey, you read my mind. Pulled out the sheet right when you said that. Uh, let's take a break, and then we'll get into more security news. We do have a lot more to talk about, that's for sure. But before we get there, let's uh, thank the sponsor of this episode, and that is Canary. Every other day we hear about these things, and you hear it all the time on shows like this. Another high-profile network breach, Sony, Target, Equifax, Yahoo!, all the companies, essentially. Some of these companies spent millions of dollars on IT security, yet still didn't know when they were compromised. Uh, thanks, Canary can change this. Just sprinkle a few Canaries in your network, make one a router, make one a Windows file share, and you just wait and attackers, APT, and malicious insiders advertise their presence by interacting with your Canary, and you get a single high-quality alert uh, to let you know what has happened. You can see all the things that people are saying about Canary, how they're using it, uh, saying, you know, the, the new uh, thanks to Canary, cloud canaries are amazing, says Jerry here. Awesome product, customer service to match. Everybody loves their Canary. Canaries are like consumer electronic devices and can be set up in under four minutes. It does not take long to get up and running. You don't get 100% of alerts from your Canaries, just one high quality alert right when it matters. Everyone spoke about honeypots in the early 2000s. You remember hearing about that. But Thingst has made them trivial to deploy with zero administration overhead. Within minutes of configuration, your canary is going to look identical to a router, a switch, a, a NAS server, a Linux box, a Windows server. Attackers can't actually tell the difference, and that's important. Thanks to Canaries, uh, don't look vulnerable on your network. They look valuable, enticing. You can put fake files on them, or even enroll them in Active Directory. Attackers can't resist. The company behind uh, Canary has been in the security game for nearly two decades. They've trained companies, militaries, and governments on how to break into networks, and they've used that experience to build Canary. The system's amazingly well-priced, Instead of a massive upfront cost, uh, canaries are licensed annually. So if your birds break down uh, during the year, Thingst will simply replace them. And the pricing also allows you to easily try a few. You can then you know, scale up as you need to. Some small shops have two canaries. Some large banks have hundreds of them. So you can really match the scale uh, that you require. Thanks to Canaries are deployed all over the world, literally on all seven continents. Some of the biggest names in Silicon Valley uh, run them and love them, and we're confident that you will too. Check out canary.tools slash twit to get more information or to see them in action for just $7,500 per year, $7,500 per year, you get five Canaries, your own hosted console, upgrades, support, and maintenance for a full year. And we have a special offer for our audience. If you use code TWIT in the How Did You Hear About Us box, you'll get 10% off the price. And that's just not a discount for this first time. That's for life. Uh, we're sure you're going to love your Thanks Canary. And if you're not happy, you can always return your Canaries with their two-month money-back guarantee, and you'll get a full refund. That's canary.tools slash twit. Make sure and enter the code twit when you get to the How Did You Hear About Us box and let them know that you heard it uh, from Security Now. And we thank uh, Canary for their support. All right. So we talked about Instagram. I'm happy about that. I'm, I'm buttoning up my Instagram account. Hopefully, once that update comes through, it hasn't come through yet. Uh, tell us a little bit about this open SSH uh, disclosure vulnerability. So um, we talked about a different one last week um, uh, in in looking at some code associated with a uh, a recent security related fix a uh, a developer said hey wait a minute uh, there's another problem here the problem was that there was a there was a way that it was possible for someone to probe an SSH server to determine whether the, the username was valid or not. So separate from the password, uh, it, it was regarded as an information disclosure vulnerability. 
Um, and and generally, you want to to only validate the username and the password together, and say you you got it or you didn't, rather than allowing someone to separately probe the username. So so that happened, and we discussed it in detail last week. Um, since then, uh, the guys at Qualys found another somewhat related problem. But as a consequence of the way the open SSH developers responded to the first one, the Qualys guys were, but were a bit put off and not really sure like what they should do about it. So I want to share what Damian Miller, who is the open SSS, uh, open SSH dev said with regard to the first problem, which we talked about last week. He wrote, hi, regarding CVE 2018-15473. A few people have asked why we just committed a fix for this without any secrecy or treating it as a security problem. The reason is that I and the other OpenSSS developers don't consider this class of bug a significant vulnerability. It's a partial disclosure of non-sensitive information. He says, we have and will continue to fix bugs like this when we're made aware of them and when the costs of doing so aren't too high. But we aren't going to get excited about them enough to apply for CVEs or do security releases to fix them. The following explains our reasoning. He says, first, this isn't user enumeration, he has in quotes, because it doesn't yield the ability to enumerate or list accounts. He says it's an oracle. That's the, the, the cryptographic technology term. Allowing an attacker to make brute force guesses of account names and verify whether they exist on the target system. Each guess is moderately expensive, requiring one TCP connection and a cryptographic key exchange, limited in concurrency by SSHD's max startups limit. He says, second, very little else in the Unix ecosystem tries to prevent this style of information disclosure. Many network daemons will still happily return user not found style messages, but more importantly, system libraries are simply not designed to consider this a threat. They don't consider it a threat because usernames have long been considered the non-secret part of user identity, of limited use without actual authentication credentials. He says, in the absence of the underlying system stack being designed with this in mind, the best applications like SSHD can do is try to paper over the most obvious differences by avoiding behavior divergences in our own code and adding some prophylactic timing delays. But it's a losing battle. And he goes on uh, with some other details that I'll skip over because they don't really matter. Anyway, that gives you a sense for the, the, the philosophical position that he has. But he does say this. He says, finally, and I think this is very salient. He says, finally, and perhaps most importantly, there's a fundamental trade-off between attack surface and this class of bug. As a concrete example... Fixing this one added about 150 lines of code to our pre-authentication attack surface. So that, that is to say, this is the code that, that anyone comes into contact to before they authenticate, meaning it is critical that it has that it that they not introduce new vulnerabilities. That is, that there's nothing that they do wrong there. 
So he says, this one added about 150 lines of code to our pre-authentication attack surface. In this case, we were willing to do this because we had confidence in the additional parsing, mostly because it's been reviewed several times and we've conducted a decent amount of fuzzing on it. But given the choice between leaving a known account validity oracle or exposing something we don't trust, we'll choose the former every time. In other words, that they would, if, 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 if it meant that fixing it might introduce a new vulnerability, eh, they're just going to leave the oracle where it is, meaning that there's something probable technically. So having read that, the guys at Qualys Security, uh, in looking over that region of code, then spotted yet another somewhat similar problem. So there's a second similar Oracle vulnerability. Uh, but due to the grumpy reaction of the previous similar issue, uh, Qualys was somewhat put off. They wrote, we understand that the open SSH developers do not want to treat such a username enumeration, and they have in parens or Oracle, as a vulnerability. And of course, they don't. They, the, 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 as we know, the open SSH developers even argue against the term username enumeration. Uh, they, they say, although, Qualys says, it is still quite useful in an attacker's toolbox. So they're asking, but how should we coordinate this disclosure then? Uh, open SSH developers and distros, please advise. So anyway, uh, I'm, our listeners know that I am constantly saying to uh, Microsoft, would you please just leave it alone? Leave Windows B, you know, give it some hope of, of like stabilizing someday. Don't keep messing with it. I mean, and, and this is exactly what the open SSH developers understand and are saying, you know, they're, I mean, open SSH is, is all about security. That's its sole benefit. You know, you don't use it to play video games. You use it for secure shell connections. So, you know, thank goodness they're being this security conscious. Last week, we acknowledged that it wasn't such a big problem. Uh, they have certainly stated that clearly and for the record, and it's it's hard to argue with that. The, you know, it's a little daunting that it was 150 lines of code required in order to to fix this problem. Um, I guess I'm glad they fixed it. It's not clear whether the, I, I I guess what they're saying is they will fix it if they can do so with confidence. But <coughs> excuse me, even so. They're not going to be issuing CVEs and, and considering this a big security problem, which, you know, I, I can certainly concur with. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I'm, you know, so GDPR, I know that this is next up and I've got <laughs> lots of questions about this. I've got a few okay. anyways. Because this, so, this is interesting to me because I, I just assumed that the GDPR happening in the EU, all those rules were going to make like sweeping changes everywhere. But apparently that's not happening. Yeah. And when you and, and so we'll explain what you're talking about and then talk about it because it is sort of an unexpected consequence. Yeah. Uh, nearly get this 1200 U.S. based news sites are deliberately remaining inaccessible, that is, they are blocking visitors from the EU as a consequence of the EU's adoption of the high fine GDPR regulations, which has just freaked everyone out. Um, and these deliberately blocked sites are not uh, all obscure since they include, get this, the Los Angeles Times, Yep, cannot bring up the L.A. Times from Europe, the Chicago Tribune, the New York Daily News, Dallas News, the Baltimore Sun, 
the Sun Chronicle, the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, and Newsday, none of them are currently available to people in the EU. Um, and since, I, as I mentioned, nearly a 1,200 uh, U.S.-based news sites, that leaves more, well more than 1,000 smaller regional news sites which provide the bulk of news reporting overall and certainly are serving their communities. Um, so as we know, the, uh, the European Union's GDPR regulations require websites to disclose their data collection practices in much more depth and detail than ever before and also requires websites to obtain an explicit permission to collect this data from its visitors. The regulation also forces websites to provide a portal where users can see what data the website has collected about them and provide a way for users to delete this data. Now, that's easy to say and easy to request. Uh, it's hard to do. I mean, it requires every single website on the internet which can be visited by someone from the European Union to comply. And so what have all of these nearly 1,200 sites done? They've said, uh, we don't need visitors from the EU. Uh, we'd rather block them than switch or invest in right now, maybe forever, uh, in in abiding by these regulations imposed by another country on us. Uh, and except for these big sites, you could argue, you know, like some Des Moines dispatch or something that, you know, like no, no one in the EU probably wants to go there anyway. So blocking the ranges of IPs that are, outside the U.S. or inside the EU, it's like, well, okay, you could argue they've saved themselves the exposure of being in breach of the GDPR, and it's not costing anybody uh, any problem for them having to do that. Um, remember that companies who do not adhere to the, to the GDPR risk facing massive fines of as much as 4% of their annual revenue which, you know, for major ongoing operations is significant. Uh, and again, I think it's rational for them to just say, uh, you're, you know, we didn't do this on purpose. Some other country has just decided that we're, we're, we're liable for uh, behavior that uh, nobody else in the world has a problem with. So fine, we're just going to block you. Um, there is an interesting script and site monitoring this. Uh, uh, Joseph O'Connor uh, grabbed the domain verifiedjoseph.com. So it's data.verifiedjoseph.com, um, which maintains a list on the fly of all the websites not available uh, as a consequence of the EU GDPR. Uh, the script ran this morning because it was fresh. He, he shows up at the top like the last time it was run. And as of this morning, when I put the notes together, there was 1,149 unavailable websites that he is monitoring and 147 that are. So, you know, <laughs> more than 1,000. Uh, actually, 1,002 more unavailable than are available and some big names among them. So an interesting uh, consequence, a side effect of, the, uh, of one nation saying, one, one, one group of countries saying, ah, we're going to fine you unless you do this uh, because our visitors might go to you, to your website. It's like, oh, okay, fine. Block them. Well, they're missing out on one uh, one way that they could make extra money because the Washington Post apparently back in May 
their response was to put up an additional paywall targeted at the EU, a premium EU paywall that would remove ads and make extra off of that. So it's like, yeah, sure, you can get it in the EU. We'll remove all the ads for you. You just got to pay us more than a basic subscription fee in order to do it. That so, Actually, that makes a lot see, of sense. They can make more uh, money. <laughs> Yeah, uh, there there was as a consequence of the the legislation. This is a, a related matter. I think it was a twenty two percent drop in cookies on on websites just uh, because of the GDPR. Uh, the, the, there were too many violations, and sites said, "Okay, we're not going to host third parties that are in violation of the GDPR because you know we can no longer afford to do that." So as as an indirect consequence, because as as we know, third party cookies are coming from ads and mm -hmm. and other unrelated sources. Typically, uh, those are down uh, by about twenty two percent. So that's been nice. Mm. Speaking of cookies, um, four years ago, in twenty fourteen, uh, Checkpoint's malware and vulnerability research group made a discovery. Um, when a client connects to a web server, they ask for some resource, you know, the, from the server. Uh, that's what the URL is. And, you know, images and the text and all the stuff that the site has are, are requested. With those requests goes any cookies that the browser has previously received from that from that domain uh, as a consequence of previous queries. So, as we know, cookies are the way. They're a mechanism that Netscape added in the early days of the web to allow this notion of logging in to a website. The the the, the actual act of obtaining a web page is stateless. The browser says, give me a bunch of stuff, and, they, and it gets it. And then if you click on a link, um, like within that site to another page, the browser asks for that page and all of that page's stuff. But nothing links, nothing links those two, you and those two pages together. There is no tracking in the original web. That was created by Netscape, where in response to the first request, which would not have had a cookie from your browser, because your browser has never been there before, the web server goes, oh, let's give them a cookie. And so a, a nonce, a, a, a one-time, you know, an, 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 a nonce is a, a, is a number once. Uh, it just a random pseudo random blob of noise is handed back to the browser in the first reply. And now the browser has a cookie. And so it sends it back on all subsequent requests, not only for the duration of the other things on that page, but when you click a link, it sends it back with the link you're clicking. And as the browser then obtains the next page and all of its assets, that cookie keeps going back. So that creates a stateful connection to the site. Okay, so it turns out, not surprisingly, the, so, so remember, the, so the, in a query, the browser is returning the cookie it received. Turns out that what Checkpoint discovered was in a huge number of of exposed residential routers, so-called SOHO, small office, home office routers, the, brow the web server that was publicly exposed was not correctly checking the length of the cookie it received. It assumed that the browser was sending back the cookie it had been given, but you could have malicious cookies or in this case, misfortunate cookies, uh, thus uh, this name. So 
Back four years ago, researchers from Checkpoint's Malware and Vulnerability Research Group uncovered this critical vulnerability, which was at the time present on millions of residential gateway devices for, across models and makers. It got assigned at the time a CVE number, 2014-9222. Uh, it was a severe vulnerability allowing an attacker to remotely take over the device, obtaining administrative privileges. At the time, they detected approximately 12 million readily exploitable unique devices on the internet across 189 countries, making it one of the most widespread vulnerabilities that had been seen at the time. And research suggested that the true number of affected devices that were not detectable might have even been greater. So anyway, the point is that anyone making a query to the website could, along with the query, essentially inject a malicious cookie into the into the query, which would induce a buffer overflow and allow that cookie to contain code, which this web server would then execute, uh, making this an incredibly potent remote code execution vulnerability. So now move forward four years. It's 2018. Uh, the Industrial Control Systems Cyber Emergency Response Team, there's a mouthful, that's the ICSCERT, has identified this same vulnerability currently widespread in medical device systems. There's a, a, a very commonly used piece of, of equipment or technology known as the Data Capture Terminal Server, the DTS, which is a medical device gateway developed by Qualcomm Life subsidiary Capsule Technologies SAS, which is widely present in medical management systems. The gateway is used in hospitals to connect medical devices into the larger network infrastructure. <coughs> Excuse me. The cybersecurity firm CyberMDX discovered the presence of the flaw, which can be exploited by attackers to conduct remote arbitrary memory rights, just like four years ago, which could lead to unauthorized login and code execution. The vulnerability in the device is present in a software component called the ROM pager from AllegroSoft, which is used by the DTS web interface. And according to CyberMDX, the version of ROM pager in use is an older version, earlier than 4.07, where this problem was fixed, and the older version is susceptible to the misfortune cookie attack. More up-to-date versions are not effective because they were patched. It turns out that even more worrisome is the fact, given you know where these things are being deployed, that the older, ver the vulnerable version has remained in use through the last four years only because the vendor would need to pay to receive updated firmware and has elected not to do so. The only silver lining uh, in this cloud is that the web server component, which is where the vulnerability is, is only utilized and required during the initial configuration of the device. So the embedded vulnerable web server can be disabled once that's uh, once the device is set up and configured. On the other hand, we all know the likelihood of that happening in the real world. Uh, it's you know almost not going to. Um, maybe a few responsible admins who become aware of this, who are listening to this podcast, um, will say, "Oh, uh, that affects me." and they'll turn this off. That would be great. Um, you know, we've often talked about how devices like this, which qualify as Internet of Things devices, 
have to take responsibility for keeping themselves up to date. These things have to periodically check with the mothership to see if if there's an update for them and and fix themselves autonomously. That this is, you know, we, we've we've moved away from SMS text messages for second factor authentication <laughs> to time based. We have we have to adopt similarly, you know, autonomous updating of IoT stuff. Our routers have to do it. You know, our light bulbs have to do it. If it's got a if it's on the internet, if it's accessible, it's got to update itself. Um, again, we're st we're in the early days yet, A and we know that because we see these things changing as as we as we slowly and reluctantly, kicking and screaming, mature. Um, but boy, it's not happening quickly. Yeah, I'm I'm filled um, with a little bit of doubt, but I'm 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 uh, at least enlightened by the fact that you say that it's early days and that it, it worked for SMS. It could work for this too, but man, that's yes. a that's an uphill battle, I think, with IoT. It is a big ask, and you're yeah. you're right, Jason, to be filled with uh, plenty of doubt. <laughs> so so, Magneto is an Adobe company uh, that boasts it powering twice as many top retailers as any other provider. What they are is an e-commerce provider. Uh, and for example, Coca-Cola and Burger King and many other users uh, uh, leverage the e-commerce platform, which Magneto offers. Is it Magneto or Magento or Magento? Ah, uh, you're right. Uh, well, uh, M-A-G-N-E-T-O. Uh, I don't know how no, you pronounce it. I, no, if you Magne click, yeah, I think if you click through, it's Magento. Oh, you're um, right. It's M-A-G-E-N-T-O. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the the. I think it's a Marvel Comics character. I mean, he's pretty awesome. But Adobe's even awesomer. I don't know. No, I don't think that works. Uh, yeah, I think it's Magento. That's interesting because uh, throughout the notes, I have Magneto Core. Uh. Magento. Anyway, Magento. Sorry. <laughs> That's all good. Magento. <laughs> Looks like Magento. Um, so, uh, good. I'm glad you caught that, Jason. Yeah, no worries. So, <laughs> over the past six months, Dutch security researcher, who we've often referred to on the podcast, Willem de Groot, uh, has found a malicious credit card skimming script, uh, which he, now I've got in here Magneto Core. Uh, but it's MagentoCore.net. So sure enough, I'm, I'm checking the actual URL here. So yes, which he named Magento Core. And I get this. He has found this on 7,339 Magento hosted storefronts. So I, I, you know, that's just, you know, the places where end users go and say, oh, I, I want to buy something and put in all of the, their name, their address, their whatever information it asks for, email, uh, phone number, uh, and credit card information on 7,339 storefronts. There has been, and in, get this, 5,172 domains right now, today, there still is skimmer script running, which uh, which grabs all of that information and <clears throat> sends it back to bad guys, apparently in Russia. Um, he explains uh, on his posting of this that victims of Magento Core who use the storefronts had their credit card and identities stolen. Um, he writes that the group that is behind this has not slowed down, that new brands, that is, you know, new storefronts, are hijacked at a pace of 50 to 60 stores per day over the last two weeks um, uh, because he's got now – it's a scanner running looking for this illegal scripting. And apparently you can just do a, uh, uh, a worldwide web search for the appropriate uh, pieces of the script. And, you know, Google will find it for you. The Magento core skimmers gain illicit access. <coughs> Excuse me. I got a little cough today.
to the control panel of an e-commerce site, often through brute force techniques, automatically trying lots of passwords, sometimes for months. So nothing is preventing them from doing long-term brute force cracking of the login to the e-commerce site control panel, which suggests that unless not in use, that control panel should be taken offline. There's, you know, unless you actively need to get to it from the web, turn off the control panel. Um, that's clearly the, the, the crux of the vulnerability here. Once they succeed in gaining access, they embed one line of JavaScript into the HTML template. Uh, and it's just a standard JavaScript invocation to HTTPS colon slash slash magentocore.net slash mage, M-A-G-E slash mage, M-A-G-E dot J-S. That script gets added to the pages and sucks off everything that the user does. It records keystrokes from unsuspecting customers and sends everything he writes in real time to the magentocore.net server registered in Moscow. Um, also, the malware includes a recovery mechanism. Uh, in the case of the, of the Magento software, it adds a backdoor to the cron.php file, which will periodically run to download the malicious code and make sure that it's not that it get it comes back after it gets removed. And there's even a clean dot JSON backup uh, as it, which is PHP code, which removes any competing malware from the site. So, uh, wow, um, I, I don't I again, this feels to me like something that that Magento needs to address by doing something like removing long-term global access to the control panel by default. So like requiring internal access only, uh, or if you make it available on the public interface, then have it automatically shut down after you know, some minutes of non-use, not just log you out, but become unavailable so that some other action is, is required in order to bring it back up publicly. That's, you know, this is, you know, this is a big problem that apparently, you know, this has been going on for six months. Certainly they're aware of it and apparently nobody's doing anything about it. Hmm. Seems wrong. Yeah. Okay. So our trusted platform module, the TPM, is present now, I, I remember, what, 10 years ago, because uh, it's been around for a long time, it wasn't clear whether you were going to have it or not. Um, my previous motherboard, which was about 15 years old, had a, a, a socket where a T, it was a, a, can't remember now, a gigabyte board, I think. It had a socket where you could, plug in an optional TPM module, but it wasn't just built into the motherboard. They are now. Uh, you know, you can verify that just by going to your BIOS, you, uh, go to the security tab in the BIOS, and you will see, you know, you can turn it on or off, you can initialize it, and, and so forth. So pretty much everybody's got TPM on board. There's a problem. Uh, and it's not with some random manufacturer's uh, backdoor or uh, bad implementation, it's actually in the spec. Researchers with the South Korean National Security Research Institute identified a flaw in the trusted platform module spec relating to the way power modes are handled. They presented this uh, their findings at again at that recent Usenix conference. Um, ACPI is the long-standing advanced configuration and power interface spec and API. Uh, 
which defines the power states for a system and the hardware registers for supporting power management. There are global states, known as G0 through 3, which are respectively working, sleeping, soft off, and mechanical off. And then there are local per device states, uh, which are the ones we're more familiar with. There's S0 and S1, which are working and power on suspended. There's S2, which is the same as S1, but that is power on suspended, but the CPU is also powered off. There's S3, which is the well-known sleep, where all devices are powered down except RAM. It keeps RAM alive. And then S4 is the formal name for hibernation, where the RAM is written out to uh, static storage, and then it too is powered off. So, you know, those, you know, sometimes you see those in the BIOS, you know, and, and essentially what ACPI does is it provides per device power management. So in order on a, on a system that's got all kinds of stuff all over it, it's possible to, to power down selectively different pieces of the entire system in order to get overall power, you know, improved power management. Well, it turns out there's a glitch in the way the TPM interfaces with ACPI such that it's possible for the TPM's boot time hash validation values to be intercepted and replaced. So uh, the, the TPM is used when we boot our systems to implement so-called secure boot. The idea with secure boot is you start with something you absolutely trust. You have to have a trust anchor, and that's the TPM. It's, it's in hardware. You cannot read stuff out of it. You can only ask it to do work for you. It is like a secure enclave on our, on our, uh, on our you know, PC-based systems. It verifies the signature of the first thing that is b before it's run. The, 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 like it, basically, it oversees the entire boot up sequence where stage by stage, the signature is verified of the software by, by taking its hash and checking it against the 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 va the valid hashes that the TPM has. The idea being that if you start from absolute secure, and you load and check every, each module in turn, there's no way for bad stuff to get in until you finally load the OS and make sure it hasn't been tampered with, and then turn over control to it. Well, turns out. By being tricky with power states, these researchers have found a way to subvert that secure chain boot up process, and they've demonstrated they've got, they have a proof of concept and it works. So, ultimately, what we're going to look at is another round of firmware updates. In this case, it's not the firmware for the processor; it's the firmware for the TPM. It is a standalone uh, microcontroller device that has firmware that runs instructions and they need to be updated to fix this. The, um, if you're in a high threat environment, uh, there is a short-term mitigation which anyone can employ if your BIOS allows you to disable the system's S3 sleeping state and Many BIOSes do that. Uh, historically, there have been systems that did not awaken from, from S3 from sleep correctly. And so uh, an option in the BIOSes for years has been to disable S3. The, ha the hack these guys have come up with absolutely requires the, that S3 be enabled. So, um, and many people don't use S3. 
they just don't have an occasion to sleep their systems. Certainly, you know, enterprise servers, probably lots of enterprise desk, uh, desktops don't, pr mostly laptops. But remember that that when you when you sleep your laptop, if there's still a power drain because RAM is being kept alive. So, so if you're if you hibernate your laptop when you close the lid or it does a full shutdown, even a laptop may not be needing the S3 state. So you can probably disable it without any inconvenience to you. And in doing so, you are protecting yourself until uh, it, until Intel probably gets around, or I guess Infineon is the actual maker of most of these TPM chips. So maybe it'll be from Infineon, then you know maybe Microsoft will push this or Intel will We'll see how we get this. But essentially, the entire industry has been put on notice that uh, it is not safe uh, to trust TPM at the moment. It can be subverted. And Jason, I think it's time for our final uh, sponsor insert. Oh. And then we will uh, wrap up the podcast with some other goodies. All right. Let's take a break then and thank, uh, for, for security now, thank Ring. I love my Ring. I have a Ring doorbell at home. I've got the alarm system. I've got uh, the floodlight cam that, that I'm going to get installed here probably in the next week. So I'm really looking forward to that. You've heard of Ring. Undoubtedly, you've heard of Ring before. They're the ones who reinvented this doorbell that you see right there to let you answer the door with your phone. They just reinvented the home alarm system. Like I said, we all know traditional alarm companies prioritize uh, high monthly premiums and then tie you into long-term contracts. Uh, Ring changed that as they do. They're disrupting that. Ring alarm is an easy to install, super easy to install, in fact, affordable home security system with no long-term contracts. You can actually build the system uh, that's right for your home so you can kind of customize it to fit your home and have it up and running in minutes. And I'm not overstating that. It's that simple. In minutes. The Ring Alarm Security Kit comes with everything you need to protect your home. And 24-7 professional monitoring is only $10 a month. It actually includes a base station, uh, which keeps your alarm system online, keeps it connected to your mobile devices. Uh, the way that you're kind of used to seeing those cameras and, and being able to tune into that uh, through your phone. The keypad, that's what you use to arm and disarm your alarm system. There's the contact sensor, which lets you know when doors or windows are open. Uh, so you can put those on high priority uh, portals throughout the home. Motion detector, which detects motion that's happening inside your home. Place that in a room that you want to know is, is absolutely secure. And then a range extender, if you want to extend the signal from your base station and beyond. Uh, like I said, it's super easy. It really does not take more than a couple of minutes to set it all up. No wires to worry about. Uh, you just kind of plug it into uh, your home, find a good place for it, mount it, and you're off. It's that easy. It really is a smarter way to protect your entire home. The Ring Alarm Security Kit can be found at ring.com and also retail stores across the U.S. You can find them everywhere. Go to uh, ring.com slash security now and you'll be able to learn how you can get whole home security for only $10 per month. Get it all set up. Pay the $10 per month and you are covered. That's ring.com slash security now. And we thank Ring for their continued support of Security Now and the Twit Network and for protecting you and your home. All right. We've got a few stories here to wrap up before we get to the crazy sonar stuff, <laughs> the, the sonar <laughs> snoop, which I'm eager to get to. But what, what else we got here? Well, so we, I've mentioned throughout the podcast already many CVE numbers, yes. which has is the is the database that we've really become quite dependent upon and not just in the U.S. but globally. Uh, in the show notes, I have a, a chart courtesy of Bleeping Computer who covered this story showing the black bars as the funding from 2012 through 2016 versus the white striped bars are the number of CVEs published. Um, the, the And so for our listeners who are only getting audio, the funding was in 2012 and moving forward each year, 
6.7 million, then dropped to 4.8, then dropped to 2.8, then dropped to 1.7 in 2015 to rise to 4.0 in 2016. But still, in 2012, it was at 6.7. Across that same period of time, the number of CVEs published has about doubled. In 2012, it was 7,370. And uh, in 2016, 14,472 reported vulnerabilities. So um, I'll share what Bleeping Computer had to say since they summarized, uh, summarized this nicely. They said, and I got the link to the Bleeping Computer story for anyone who wants it. The CVE, they said, was created in 1999 by the MITRE Corporation using U.S. government funding. It's a database that, cover, that contains identifiers, tracking numbers, for security vulnerabilities. Since its creation, the CVE system has been adopted by the public and private sectors. Most modern cybersecurity software use CVE numbers to identify and track cyber attacks exploiting particular software bugs. Despite being a U.S. creation, the system has been widely adopted in countries all over the globe, which use and recognize the CVE identifiers issued by MITRE staff and industry partners. But in recent years, writes Bleeping Computer, the CVE system has been under stress. Its problems became evident in late 2015 and early 2016 when a large number of security researchers reported long delays in receiving CVE numbers for the vulnerabilities they were reporting. At one point, a few of them united to create an alternative vulnerabilities database known as the Distributed Weakness Filing, DWF. At the time, MITRE said the CVE numbered assignment delays were caused by the increased number of software vendors compared to the late 90s and nearly, oh, and the, er, the late 90s and early to, uh, 2000s, but also because of the proliferation of software-driven SCADA, you know, the, the industrial control equipment, and Internet of Things devices. In other, in other words, more companies creating equipment, more security researchers reporting, and more things going wrong to report. Both factors, writes Bleeping Computer, contributed to a huge rise in vulnerability reports with which the CVE staff wasn't managing to keep keep up to date. And, you know, of course, at the same time, their budget was being cut every year. A late 2016 report found that MITRE CVE failed to assign CVE numbers to over 6,000 vulnerabilities discovered in 2015. So they you know there were 14,000 numbers assigned 16,000 weren't so actually more than 20,000 vulnerabilities so in march of last year the us senate um, got involved to investigate the problems and concluded quote from 2012 to 2015 the program has received on average 37% less year over year funding also, they said the documentation produced by DHS and MITRE shows that the CVE contract vehicle is both unstable and prone to acute fluctuations in scheduling and funding. To solve this issue, the Senate's committee proposed that DHS officials move CVE's funding from a contract-based funding scheme into the Department of Homeland Security itself as a what's known as a PPA, a program project or activity funding line item. The committee believes this would provide a constant stream of funding, reducing huge budget fluctuations and keep MITRE focused on running the CVE database instead of always worrying about its future ends or future funds. So, uh, that all sounds good to me. I hope that that happens and that they're given enough money because it's very clear that this is providing a vital 
uh, clearinghouse database for managing uh, all of these cybersecurity threats, which, as we know, uh, can be significant. Um, Mozilla has announced a very welcome change of anti-tracking approach for future Firefoxes, which is available in the Firefox nightly builds for anyone who wants to enable it. Uh, in their posting, they said, anyone who isn't an expert on the internet would be hard pressed to explain how tracking on the internet actually works. And of course, we've, <laughs> we've been left breathless on this podcast doing just that. Some of the negative effects, they write, of unchecked tracking are easy to notice, namely eerily specific targeted advertising and a loss of performance on the web. However, many of the harms of unchecked data collection are completely opaque to users and experts alike, only to be revealed piecemeal by major data breaches when they occur. In the near future, Firefox will by default, and that's the key, you don't have to go anywhere and flip anything on, by default, protect users by blocking traffic while also offering a clear set of controls to give our users more choice over what information they share with sites. Over the next few months, they write, we plan to release a series of features that will put this new approach into practice through three key initiatives. Um, get this. Under improved page load performance, they wrote, tracking slows down the web. In a study by Ghostery, 55.4%, okay, 55.4, more than half of the total load time required to load an average website was spent loading third-party trackers. <laughs> half, right? <laughs> third-party trackers are more than doubling the amount of time required to load our pages. That's they great. say for users on slower networks, uh, I would just say for anybody, the effects can be, oh, on slower networks, the effects can be even worse. Long page loads are detrimental to every user's experience on the web. For that reason, we've added a new feature in Firefox Nightly that blocks trackers that slow down page loads. We will be testing this feature using a shield study in September. If we find that our approach performs well, we will start blocking slow loading trackers by default in Firefox 63. So that's very cool. Um, what that means is they will, they, they will instrument Firefox. Uh, five seconds is what I saw um, referenced elsewhere. So if a tracker takes more than five seconds to get itself loaded, it will be blacklisted and it will no longer be loaded by Firefox, to which I say, bravo. What this, and it's interesting too, because think about it. Trackers don't have any particular incentive to be speedy. Websites do, but websites don't have control over the trackers that their ads load or that other third-party assets load. So websites are being hurt by indirectly by the trackers that the thing the assets they're invoking are loading. So this really is great. This this says to trackers, get your servers sped up. <coughs> Excuse me, <coughs> so that so that you are able to respond to the requests you are creating on web pages. Otherwise, be blocked. So I think this is great. Fantastic news. And you have to imagine that fire, that uh, Firefox, for the work on Firefox Focus, which came out, I think, in 2015. Ah, right. Uh, initially for iOS. Now it's on Android. And that would their focus, well, uh, no pun intended, uh, when they first launched was to basically block the tracking. And then, you know, it's kind of expanded into other privacy kind of emphasized uh, sort of uses. But uh, yes. yeah, that's great. 
any way that it can speed things up and cl and clean up the experience. Oh, yeah, God, yes. Remove and, the muck. You know, and and Google is in, of course, as we know, a bit of a dicey problem because their revenue all comes from essentially from uh, web-based advertising, which is enhanced by tracking. Sure. So it'll be interesting to see uh, what they do if they follow suit. Um, also, that that was the first of three. Second of the three is removing cross-site tracking. Uh, Mozilla writes, in the physical world, users would not expect hundreds of vendors to follow them from store to store, spying on the products they look at or purchase. Users have the same expectations of privacy on the web, and yet in reality, they are tracked wherever they go. Most web browsers fail to help users get the level of privacy they expect and deserve. In order to help give users the private web browsing experience they expect and deserve, Firefox will strip cookies and block storage access from third-party tracking content. We've already made this available for our Firefox nightly users to try and we'll be running a shield study to test the experience with some of our beta testers in September. We aim to bring this protection to all users in Firefox 65 and will continue to refine our approach to provide the strongest possible protection while preserving a smooth user experience. So that's big. That's not the DNT, you know, please don't track me flag that you can set. This is the browser itself not honoring third party. That is cross origin content. And again, uh, I say yay. Um, and then the third of three, mitigating, mitigating harmful practices. They write deceptive practices that invisibly collect identifiable user information or degrade user experience are becoming more common. For example, some trackers fingerprint users, a technique that allows them to invisibly identify users by their device properties and which users are unable to control. Other sites have deployed crypto mining scripts that silently mine cryptocurrencies on the user's device. Practices like these make the web a more hostile place to be. Future versions of Firefox will block these practices by default. They, and they say, note that these features are currently available in the nightly Firefox nightly builds. Users wishing to experiment with them may manually enable them. And in the link that I have uh, to uh, at the top of the story to Mozilla's blog, um, there are the details uh, uh, spelled out for how to turn these, how to do the Firefox nightly enablement of these uh, if you're curious. And again, I just, I'm, Firefox is still my go-to browser, mostly because it handles uh, side located tabs uh, so nicely. And I, I desperately need tabs, uh, horizontal tabs running vertically down the side of my uh, browser window. So I'm sticking with it for now. And I'm sure happy with these uh, privacy related features that they're supporting. Yeah, very nice. I'll just note that Microsoft did uh, release a non patch Tuesday substantial update, which fortunately, my Windows 10 machine that I'm talking to everybody uh, and you uh, all over Jason uh, was able to digest uh, in time for the podcast. Right. Uh, it wasn't security related. It was a whole host of non-security related problems. I won't enumerate them because literally there's too many. But reading the list, as I did, uh, of the things that they fixed makes you glad that Windows 10 was working beforehand. Because, wow, I guess there's all kinds of little fringe edge conditions and things that they are working on. And as I've said, if they if they would only just leave it alone, then they could fix these things and not be breaking more things at the same time. But, you know, that's clearly falling on deaf ears because here we are at Windows 10, even though earlier Windows worked just fine. Anyway, grumble, grumble. Um, 
I found a really nice note from a Rick uh, Zeke. He he actually helped me pronounce his name. It's spelled R I C H, but pronounced Zeke in Tucson. He said, "Steve, I've built this machine for my father's business, and it had been running good for a few years." Over those years, we replaced the motherboard and also the power supply (laughs) and added a high-end graphics card as he now pushed the computer to a large 50-inch 4K TV screen and wanted the best picture he could get. Recently, he started to get some pink screens of death. And, And Rich says, or Rick says, yes, a pink screen, not a blue screen. Evidently, when you're running NVIDIA 1070 or other high-end video cards, the blue will change colors to pink. As strange as I found that, the point was that the machine was rebooting randomly. I also tested that concept. I took out the video card and did indeed continue to get blue screens with the card out. I could not, for the life of me, figure it out. Lots of help on the internet for things like make sure to update the Intel video drive uh, even though it's not active, run your Windows updates, or reset your RAM. I guess that means you know pulling the, pulling the, the dims out and pushing them back, back in again, which I certainly know well. That's, that's kept a few of my machines going. He said, I had not individually tested all the pieces of hardware in a separate machine. And all would run fine with the other machine. He was running a strange version of Windows 8.1. So I even upgraded him to 10 and even put it on a 500 gig SSD, which was brand new. However, I had cloned the disk over to the new one and then ran the Windows upgrade. I finally thought, Could I have cloned over corrupt data? So I pull out my spin right on my bootable USB stick and ran it on level two. I had no expectations of it working as I thought spin right would only fix damaged disks and not damaged data. But what did I have to lose? Well, it's been a week. And no reboots yet from pink screens. Yeah, he says with three exclamation points. Um, and I'll just note that it is true that Spinrite's focus is on recovering sectors which the drive says it cannot read. But there is, as we've often talked about, a, a disturbingly large gray area. And as defects get large, it is possible for the drive to miscorrect those sectors so that it believes it has performed an effective error correction because it's actually statistics when in fact it has not. It's a little bit like a parity error which can correct even or odd parity and so it will detect a single bit flipping because that will change the parity of the entire block. But two bits flipping, it won't detect because that is that, that maintains the same parity. ECC is the same way. Spinrite won't be fooled. So what happened was Spinrite realized there were sectors which were being miscorrected by the original hard drive it fixed them correctly and rewrote them so the drive then worked properly. So uh, it's always surprising people how much there is under the covers of Spinrite that, you know, it's not revealed by the fact that you just run it and it fixes everything. But that's what it does. Does it ever surprise you at what it's capable? Uh, like at this point, have you seen, you've oh, seen yeah. it all? Oh, yeah, yeah. And in <laughs> fact, I, I talked about how uh, my my bookkeeper operations gal, I had set her up with a ra- with a mirrored raid and the first drive died and she didn't want to bother me. 
And I've since explained to her, Sue, that's when you bother me. That's, you know, why we have a raid to be redundant. And in fact, I, I talked about this on the podcast before. It annoyed me that the raid continued to say, I'm damaged, but okay. It's like a consumer raid should say, okay, one drive is down. Uh, fix me now while you can still clone the good drive to a, another good drive. But it didn't. It just kept on going for months <laughs> until the second one died. And that's when I got the call from Sue saying, uh, my computer won't boot. And I said, really? So I made a house call and I said, uh, wow, both drives are dead. And that's when she confessed that, you know, one had died a long time ago. And I just said, oh, okay, next time the first, when the first one goes, that's, believe me, you're not inconveniencing me. You're saving me time. <laughs> right. So <laughs> the point is, well, she, the system was completely down. I ran Spinrite on it. I don't remember which of the two drives came back. One of them did. Maybe they both did. I don't remember. And then I was able to, you know, there was zero data loss and we brought the system back up. And uh, I think I probably put new drives on it because why not? Uh, and she's off again and haven't ha hasn't had any problems since. Although <laughs> she is complaining that, you know, it's getting a little old. So it's time to get her fixed up. But anyway, Spinrite does perform, does surprise me often. Awesome. Um, uh, okay. Sonar scoop. Uh, Snoop. Uh, Snoop. Oh, Snoop. Yeah. You, See, you, why See, do I do? Uh, yeah. You and I both did that. No, yes. I totally did it before the show. And I was, <laughs> what is a sooner? I think it, it corrected to sooner scoop, which for the Sooners, uh, it was, so, a, it was a sports site. And I was like, this, yes. th for the Oklahoma Sooners football team. And I was like, this is not right. <laughs> so I'll tell you, this is the, this is the best time of year for the podcast. Cause we've got the use Nix conference and we've got black hat and DEF CON. I mean, it is right. just security conference heaven. Uh, so this is another piece of research that was shown at the three weeks ago. Now Baltimore use Nix security conference. Um, in the show notes, I have a picture from their research PDF, which they published as part of the, uh, the conference proceedings. It shows the back of a Samsung Galaxy S4 with the microphone that you would uh, – with the microphone at the top of the phone and the speaker on the back – Oh, I'm sorry, the, the, the microphone at the bottom that you normally talk to and, the, and a speaker at the bottom. And then on the on the other picture is a is a top located microphone and a top located speaker. So the top one is where your ear normally is. And you, obviously the bottom microphone is where your mouth normally is. But for to to increase noise cancellation uh, and the, the the utility of the phone, they put both the microphone and a speaker also on the opposite ends. So you've got a top microphone, a top speaker, a bottom microphone, and a bottom speaker. Well, the next page of the show notes, I show their simplified diagram of what that means. That means you can ping from the top speaker a ultrasonic sound that the user will not hear, which will be received after some length of time based on how far away the person is and the, the rate at which sound travels will be heard by the upper microphone. Similarly, you can ping from the bottom speaker and it will bounce off the underside of the user's finger and back into the bottom microphone. In other words, classic sonar. And now to triangulate, you really would want the sensors to be mounted on adjacent corners of the area. That way, if you get you you if you take the two distances, you know, so so they're on it's called triangulate because they're the the two sensors lie on one edge of a triangle. And then the distance that they're each sensing uh, informs it of the 
this the length of the other two lengths of the triangle, allowing it to uniquely determine the apex of the triangle not containing the sensors, thus triangulation. We don't have that here. We've got, you know, kind of arbitrarily located sensors. So it's less than ideal, but their research demonstrates that they are able to, to, to not perfectly, but to significantly determine the instantaneous position of a user's finger, which is in contact with the screen. So, for, so, so reading from their abstract at the top of their research, they said, we report the first active acoustic side channel attack. Speakers are used to emit human inaudible acoustic signals, you know, like bats, and the echo is recorded via microphones, turning the acoustic system into a smartphone sonar system. The echo signal can be used to profile user interaction with the device. For example, a victim's finger movements can be inferred to steal Android unlock patterns. In our empirical study, the number of candidate unlock patterns that an attacker must try to authenticate herself to a Samsung S4 phone can be reduced by up to 70% using this novel acoustic side channel. So, no, not reduced to zero, but, you know, it's reduced by more than half. The attack is entirely unnoticeable to victims. Our approach, they write, can be easily applied to other application scenarios and device types. Overall, our work highlights a new family of security threats. So in terms of details, they, they used a dictionary of 12 unlock patterns. Okay, so not the, not the universe of possible unlock patterns. They just, you know, they were looking for, does this kind of work at all? So they, they used a dictionary of 12 unlock patterns in their tests, which contained 15 unique strokes. The data collected from 12 volunteers uh, was fed into, a, in, in, into an AI learning machine model for classification of each stroke. And as expected, the classification accuracy was significantly higher when input, simultaneous input from both micros, microscopes was con, microphones was considered. The researchers reduced the average number of correct candidates from the 12 unlock patterns to 3.6. That's average. In some instances, the analysis eliminated all guesses and revealed the single correct pattern uniquely. Um, I looked at the research, and I won't go into any more detail here because everybody gets it, um, but the, the, I have a strong gut sense that we're going to see this evolve. Um, this, um, it's, it uses sensors available in our devices. It could certainly be used for benign purpose, like, you know, moving your hand around in front of an app in order to do something and having the app respond. It's not super high fidelity. Again, the sensors are not located exactly where you want them. Was it the Apple? I mean, it was a, the Amazon phone. They had like some funky sensor in each corner of the screen for a while, didn't they, Jason? And they, yeah. And that, and that was meant to kind of change the parallax of, of what you were looking at. It was, it was meant to kind of like, I don't know, from the four points, be able to, to know determine where, your perspective where, and shift accordingly. To, so like to, to, to see your face, so that they could change the screen in order to make it look more depthy. It was a lot of hardware for a very minimal application <laughs> <Okay>. purpose. <Yeah. laughs> but yeah. no, what this reminds me of is if you remember, I think it was like three or four years ago at Google I.O., Google had shown off something called Project Soli, which was also... Oh, my 
yes, yes, yes. And I am so jazzed by that where you like, yep. you do like, you know, like, like push buttons and, and turn knobs and things. Oh, yep. I really want to see that happen. I haven't really heard much about it since then. And I think their, their idea was that it would possibly be integrated into like wearables, like uh, smart watches of some sort so that you wouldn't have to touch it, but you could still do the controls. And then there's yes, also something else uh, that I read about called, what was it? It was called Finger IO, which there's a demonstration yes. And that that's that seems a little bit more in line with what Sonar Snoop is all about. Yeah, and um, uh, uh, Soli was uh, EM radiation, so right. it was it, it was, was it was very low level electromagnetic radiation that, that gave it extremely high resolution in return for having to have a lot of processing behind it. But right. but anyway, this is I thought this was very cool, very clever, something no one had thought of before, and. I wouldn't be surprised if we see this uh, evolving in the future. This feels like something that uh, could be taken from this initial research out to its next level. So uh, <laughs> props to these guys and a nice piece of research. Yeah. No matter what you call it. No matter what you call it. I'm Sweet curious on a, on a device specific perspective because like you were saying, you know, every, every phone has a microphone and a speaker in a different location. Yeah. And yeah. so, you know, for this to work on a broad spectrum of Android devices, like I imagine those locations diff like create different hurdles as far or different requirements for where exactly on the screen your finger is at any given moment. If the speakers and microphones are over here versus over there, does that then narrow down, you know, the accuracy differently? Well, and, and so, for devices? example, one, one thing that's if somebody wanted to be clever, they could create a game which which you know inherently requires you to move your finger around and touch different areas of the screen. Oh, to learn. While yes, yeah. while you're playing the game, it's doing sonar on you, and you don't know. It's calibrating. To, yes. Yep. That's that. Yep. Dang it. That's that's too wise. <laughs> that's too smart. And you know what? That'll probably happen. Uh, but this only really, from a security standpoint, it seems like this really only works if you're doing like a, a swipe pattern right would it would it be would yeah. there be any indication I, that it would work with like tapping in a pin or something along those and that, lines? and then see that that's exactly what i mean when i say this feels like first gen yeah and so you know they demonstrated the concept is viable <laughs> and so i wouldn't be surprised if before long they could turn this into read you know read keystrokes on a keyboard Totally. Well, that's another thing that's kind of reminded me of the, the whole thread from years ago about uh, people being able to listen to someone typing on a keyboard uh, and being able to reconstruct what they're typing based on the sound yeah. of those keys clacking. Yeah, that's just bizarre, but yeah. it's true. Yeah. Yep. Oh, this stuff is crazy. Uh, very interesting. Well, we'll certainly find out more uh, about that as we go along. But have we missed anything? We're done, baby. We hit it. We hit the end. Our outro has been Sonar Snoop. Oh, my God. And look at that. My clock says one hour 50. Oh, there it is. Two hours. Two zero 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 zero. <laughs> we made it. Steve, thank you so much for uh, for uh, all the news and uh, diving in deep on all this stuff. Uh, it's always awesome to get the chance to, to do this with you. And I get another two weeks, so I'm looking forward to that. Um, for folks who don't already know, you already know, but as a reminder, grc.com. If you want to find all the cool stuff that Steve is up to, you can get Spin right there, which you heard him talk about a little bit ago, the best hard drive recovery and maintenance tool. You can get your copy there. Uh, I'm sure information on Squirrel, all sorts of stuff found at your site, right? Yep. Yep. <laughs> so make sure and do that, uh, grc.com. Uh, and if you want to find this show, I think you're also posting audio and video over there as well, right? We have audio, video, and and the transcripts are uniquely available over at grc.com slash security now. Yes, and you'll want those transcripts as well. So uh, check it out over there. Uh, you can also come to our site, of course. We have the show, every single episode, cataloged at twit.tv slash sn. You can find audio and video there. Uh, subscribe to the podcast. Of course, you can find this on on YouTube and Anywhere that, you you know, if you have a smart TV, just do a search in the in the console there. You're going to find it. And, uh, yeah, I think that's about it. We record live every Tuesday starting at 1.30 p.m. Pacific. That's 4.30 p.m. Eastern, uh, 2030 UTC. 
And, uh, you know, twit.tv slash live if you want to watch us live. Uh, thanks to the folks in the chat room. They were throwing out some uh, valuable information uh, to us as well that kind of made its way into the show. So that's that's what I love about the live experience. People get in there, they're chatting about it, and sometimes it kind of makes its way in. So we appreciate their uh, participation as well. But uh, that is it. Steve, thank you so much, man. And we will see you next week. <laughs> thanks, buddy. All Talk right. to you next week. Take care. Another episode of Security Now. See you later. Bye, Bye everybody. Security now.